Okay, Martin, it's two o'clock. Are you ready? <laughs> um, just one um, quick thing. Yeah, yeah, take your time. Okay, um, yeah, I think I am ready. <laughs> okay, then uh, welcome everyone again to, to this afternoon's uh, session. And uh, today's lecture by Martin is the last one in the cycle of the second lectures. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think today Martin's plan, uh, if I remember correctly, is to start uh, with the genomics part of, 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 of his course. After last time, he, he gave us a, a crash course in uh, models for uh, epidemiological studies. Yeah. So Martin, we are very keen and eager to, to listen to your, to your second lecture. And I just want to remind the, the listeners to, uh, to ask questions, because again, we will have a competition for the best question that we will reward with a book voucher. So Martin, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot. And so let me start in um, with what I um, announced last time um, and uh, what Francesco just said is, you know, for the most part, what I will um, do on today's lecture. But um, I decided to um, um, continue at the very beginning a bit on some of the things from last time. So the first thing I want to um, tell you a little about is, you know, very, um, you know, down to earth with uh, Python. So I just wanted to uh, quickly show you a few tricks about sort of how to find information and documentation and making things work. Um, and um, sort of showing you that you don't have to know everything in order to write um, programs, that there's some easy shortcuts. Um, then I also wanted to um, talk to you a little about what might be described as finite population effects. So we talked about um, these uh, SIR models um, where you have a continuous ordinary differential equation where populations are represented by continuous um, uh, variables. In other words, the number of people um, is not an integer, but it's a real number. So you could have 10 to the minus 20 persons infected and stuff like that. And I don't want to dwell too much on the details, but I just wanted to show you um, one example where um, including stochastic effects um, can really change things a lot and makes a lot of difference. And I'm also going to show you um, a, a Python program uh, that um, sort of verifies some of the hand-waving arguments that I, I make to show that um, the arguments um, should be believed to some extent. Um, then um, the rest of the lecture is going to be kind of more, um, uh, for some of you, this may be new. For others, this may be a review. But I wanted to go over DNA and proteins and um, what I call the molecular basis of inheritance. And I'm going to start um, rather far back 
with uh, sort of Gregor Mendel's experiments with uh, um, more of a mathematical um, interpretation. And the reason I want to do this is that I think uh, sometimes in science, you know, we're taught too many facts and not really an appreciation of how things were discovered. And I mean, you're doing postgraduate programs here um, to, in order to discover new things, not to just amass facts. So I think it is useful to spend some time sort of reflecting on how things were figured out and it gives us some uh, insight into how to find interesting problems, what is important. And it's not always what people at the time thought was important. And that's also something to think about. So these are just sort of general remarks. Um, also in these lecture notes, um, I'm going to show, show you some of this, but some of them are rather dense and I've sort of made the slides so that you can go back and um, uh, look at uh, you know, some of the details. You don't have to take um, really careful notes. So with the first thing I'm going to now um, uh, go away from this full screen um, and show you sort of on a, a Python um, uh, um, so I have IPython running here and I basically loaded the um, program that we, let's see if we can, I think we can even um, sample that SIR dot py so you can um well let me first see if this does what i think it does um sorry martin are we supposed to see your screen or not yet oh i'm sorry <laughs> uh yes you should i forgot to share it i'm sorry <laughs> anyway up till now you okay, were that's great thank you the the first um uh slide um, so you you didn't miss much and this is the ipython prompt and this is um this is the program that i i showed you last time so i showed you how if we didn't know uh, it, you know how we can find libraries to do things we want uh on the web and in the documentation that um, Python has a lot of uh, sort of tricks that um, figure out, uh, you know, things that you, you don't have memorized. So here we have this uh, ODE solver and um, it returns a whole bunch of stuff and, and we don't really know what it is. We wouldn't really know that unless we, you know, um, do this kind of programming every day. So you can just sort of play around. And generally, um, if you try to print something or um, in the interactive prompt, um, uh, just um, type the, the variable, it'll um, sort of give you what you want to know. So we can get quite a bit of information this way. And suppose we want to know what this uh, dot sol is. So this is a Python class with, uh, and, and these are all of the attributes. So it's some sort of a, a function here. So if I do this, um, it sort of tells me some stuff that's not too enlightening, but I can also do help. Uh, like this, and it gives me a whole bunch of information. Um, so you can sort of uh, 
navigate your way and find out a whole lot of stuff without ever you know, um, really looking at the documentation. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the documentation, but this sometimes is faster. Or if I want to find the um, solution and what are the options, I can press, I'm going to press the tab key. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, my, my computer's a bit slow and it's uh, giving me all these different options. And, you know, you can do this. I think I have NumPy um, uh, uh, defined as N. So if I press the tab key, I'm probably going to get tons of options. Um, let's see. And then there are other things like uh, what variables you have defined. Um, what is, um, is this a directory or I could uh, sort of look at, um, uh, say the, all the variable names in um, the NumPy library. Let's see, will this work? Yeah. So you can sort of explore around. So um, that's basically all I wanted to, to say about that. But um, you, you don't really know, have to know everything. You can sort of program interactively and explore and um, you know, find various tricks to find what you're, you're looking for. Okay, so let's return to um, uh, some epidemiology. And um, it's sort of ironic that some of the, what we're going to talk about right now, it has to do with um, uh, measles and finite population effects that um, we're going to see um, some of the same mathematics and ideas about random walks when we um, look at uh, population genetics and um, how genes get uh, fixed um, where there's not a um, strong enough selection um, pressure. So let's... Um, go back to sort of trashing the SIR models. Um, so uh, the SIR models um, just tell you what's going to happen on the average. And that can actually not even give you the average um, behavior, but it can give you wrong uh, conclusions if you don't have a, a sort of infinite population. So there, if you have a finite fluctu uh, population, well, um, if I see uh, I'm in contact with other people and, and I'm infected, um, the most rational um, uh, uh, hypothesis would be that you have a sort of Poisson um, process, you know, you're giving off this virus and a certain number of people may get infected or may not, but it's going to um, uh, obey a Poisson distribution. So uh, Poisson distribution is uh, um, where, you know, events happen at a certain rate and there are no correlations. And if the mean is N events, taking place, then the um, standard deviation is the square root of n. So the fluctuations become more important the smaller the number n is, or you know, if you're not averaging. So here we see this integral over a short time, and I just take this for the contacts and assume the model's correct, but this is sort of a stochastic process. So we're going to explore the um, 
effects of this. And um, I'm going to show you that uh, 500,000 is not a very large number. So um, if you have, um, say, measles and you have this sort of city of 500,000 people, and this is before the, you know, vaccination that I'm going to show you that um, in a rather short time period, uh, the measles virus would become extinct, whereas um, the uh, um, solution that you get in the sort of average values where you take averages at all points is that, um, uh, you know, the measles would become endemic and um, occur forever. Um, so this is due to um, fluctuations and I'll go through this a bit uh, slowly so that you can sort of see where the numbers come in that give you that, you know, 500,000 isn't a, a big, as big a number as you think. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, a lot of this is, I'm not, I sort of want to get to the program, but um, let's talk about some sort of basic um, facts about measles. And um, we're going to just do an order of magnitude analysis. I mean, if we wanted to write a paper, um, we would have to do more polished calculations, but I just want to do something that you can do on a few transparencies and show you how you can get the answer in, um, and, and sort of check your reasoning with the simple computer program. Um, so R is, you know, uh, about, R not is about 15 or I'm going to put 20 for measles. So that means that everybody will catch measles at some point in their life. And Measles are infectious for about a week. Um, I mean, I don't really care whether it's a few days or two weeks. We're, we just want to get things approximately right. And we're going to assume that everyone is lives for 70 years. So if no one had measles and everyone were susceptible, you know, you would have this big outbreak and within a few months, almost everybody would have gotten it. And except for 5% of the population. And then there would be sort of this population of people who are infected. So there are two numbers that um, sort of um, tell you what this, uh, um, the size of this infected population is. Well, there's the Everyone, 95%, uh, uh, which is close enough to everyone, is going to have measles at some time in their life. And, um, uh, and it only lasts for a week. So then we can, um, uh, you know, do the calculation and there's going to be about 130 people at any time who is who are infected. And but this is just an average. So each week they infect uh, a new batch of people who in turn um, infect a new batch, etc. And this continues every week as a time step. Now you might say, well, um, that isn't quite right. Um, that uh, uh, if the, for the fluctuations that um, it's a continuous process and, you know, if too many people get infected, it's not really going to be a random walk. Um, but let's just assume that we're in this uh, endemics uh, situation 
And it's just a Poisson distribution and R is um, approximately one. So we want to just have a random walk and we want to see how long does it take uh, for you to get a fluctuation where you walk all the way down to zero people infected. And that's sort of like uh, hitting a boundary where if you hit the boundary, you get absorbed or from the virus's point of view, you get killed. So that's the end of the game. Um, so we can um, uh, sort of by making shameless approximations, uh, taking the mean of the, the um, well, the standard deviation of the Poisson process, each week we um, take a, a step that is n, uh, the square root of the number of people. So that's sort of 10 people. And um, how many steps do we, such steps do we have to take before um, it's all over? Um, th that is that at some point, no one uh, manage to, manages to uh, in fact, the cohort that's going to sort of carry on the disease. So in a random walk, um, if you go, um, if you want to take N, you know, basic steps, it takes N squared. Um, uh, it takes approximately N squared steps to go that far because it's sort of a square root, it's a diffusive progression. So then we get n squared. So we get the estimate that it's going to be 100 weeks and then the epidemic ends. Of course, if you get these, um, uh, you, you could criticize this. You, you, um, the, and, I would say that this analysis ignores order of one factors, you know. So as you get closer to zero, the square root of a uh, hundred should be replaced by the square root of the, you know, uh, local number, and that sort of pushes the boundary a bit farther. But one might think that this is just an order. Uh, one effect. Um, there also is going to not be a sort of linear drift that tries to keep you toward a hundred. Um, so we would have to do some more work, but instead of doing this, let's just uh, write a simple Python program that um, does this uh, calculation. So let's see. Um, let me quit this um, interpreter so I can sort of have a clean uh, slate and I'm going to um, type this, uh, this meta command that sort of creates the right environment. So I think I can um, show you the listing. Um, let's see. So this is a, a super um, simple program. So there are a bunch of loops, but I start with a hundred um, a hundred people who are infected, and then I'm, I'm just recording, um, uh, let's see. This is the first element of a list, um, but this is just for keeping the data. Then I um, repeatedly carry out a Poisson process where um, the um, average number of people infected is uh, mu of the Python uh, of the Poisson distribution is uh, it, it is you know that that's realized once and you um, 
you, you basically take a random step and this is repeated over and over again. Um, let's see, so here we, I, I want to plot the trajectories, but basically this infinite loop continues till the result of the random walk is to hit zero, at which point this uh, infinite loop is broken. And um, then I, I want to look at the distribution of lengths and I also want to record the um, entire um, entire sequence. And here I just make some plots. So this is, I sort the lengths and then um, for reasons that you'll see, I um, have a semi-log plot. And then I'm just going to show you um, a number of, of, um, of trajectories. So let's see, let's, let's run this script. So there, there's still a number of approximations in here and um, also the sort of discretization from week to week. Um, it's not going to give you any uh, reliable predictions, but it's going to um, test the qualitative behavior to some extent. So um, <clears throat> here I'm running this and I'm printing out the number of steps. And you can see that um, sometimes it's very short and sometimes it's very, um, uh, it takes a, a very long time. So this is a cumulative probability distribution for the number of steps that it takes to hit the boundary. So it would be the number of, um, number of weeks for the epidemic to become extinct. So let's see. Um, nine, eight, seven, six, five. So the shortest is 50 steps. Um, my estimate was about 100 weeks. Um, so, you know, that's not the median. The median would be about 300, but <clears throat> you know, what's a, a factor of three? And then the other thing that you see here is that um, there's a very long tail where you get a you know large wandering of into you know very long excursions to having more cases before you um, change direction. So a lot of the things that we see here, um, it's not really just epidemiology. Um, these are sort of uh, generic properties of random walks that occur in, in all areas of um, theoretical physics and applied maths. Um, okay, so, and here you can see, um, now when I ran this, um, uh, earlier, um, and I could run it again. Um, um, the, you know, I didn't want to draw too many um, realizations, but here you can see the green excursion really goes very far before it uh, sort of um, comes back. And here we have uh, some very um, short ones. So this is, you know, the property of, of, of random walks. Um, a random walk in one dimension comes back to the origin in um, an infinite number of times and goes through every point an infinite number of times. And then um, in uh, three dimensions, 
um, there's a certain probability, of course, to come back to the origin that um, that uh, uh, is, you know, it's less than one. So paths tend to go off and, you know, wander out to infinity and, you know, circle around but never really come back. Um, so the dimension is is quite important. So this is a sort of generic property of random walks. Let's just run this one more time. I'm just curious what the the four plots look like. I, I think they'll be different. Okay, yeah, here you can see that the um uh that the random walks are not so, you know, dispersed. There's a long one and there's, you know, a sort of intermediate one. So we could um, play with this some more, but I think uh, the point is that, um, let me go back to full screen, that you should be wary of, um, uh, ignoring fluctuations. And there's a, a sort of tendency to believe that, uh, well, and fl fluctuations are going to be a small correction, but here um, it turns out to be a, a game changer. And um, I, I mean, namely because the population that you, um, is infected at any one time is much smaller. So you have all these other factors conspiring so that the population size is, um, is, uh, is, is the relevant population size is less than you think. And then the turnaround time is, you know, not the lifetime of a person, but a week. So that allows you to have quite a few steps. Um, this is actually, um, this was pointed out by Barnett in the 50s, and it's quite uh, relevant in studies of, uh, you know, um, for example, um, eliminating polio and other diseases. So um, you can ask the question, well, do you have to reach every remote uh, village in the world? Or are there going to be these um, isolated villages where the disease will persist? And if you don't vaccinate them, then um, uh, it'll, um, it, it'll, it'll come back unless you, you vaccinate everybody. And the result uh, is that um, if you have populations that are sufficiently isolated and small that the, um, it, an infectious disease cannot um, persist. Um, so a, a lot of research has gone into sort of trying to quantify that more um, in terms of planning. Okay, so let's... Um, uh, switch gear and let's talk a bit about um, genetics because we're going to be talking about um, DNA of, uh, of, of uh, viruses or in particular the COVID-19 and this, um, so that this was sort of one of the emphases of um, these lectures, but I, I sort of want to make sure that everybody is, uh, you know, on the same page as far as, you know, um, knowledge of genetics. And it's really interesting that a lot of the work on, um, I mean, genomes and population genetics now is really popular. And it's considered a really hot field because of the Human Genome Project and its progeny. And there are all these online databases. And I'll show you some of the information that you can just get 
um, from these publicly available databases. So this is kind of new that um, most of the data anybody can get. It's not your traditional, well, you do an experiment and you hold on to your data and, you know, um, you have this proprietary um, period. It's a quite different organization. But a lot of the theory um, was worked out in, uh, correctly in most cases, not completely well before um, people knew that, you know, DNA was the uh, carrier of uh, genetic information or sort of the program to create, re uh, recreate uh, organisms. Um, and, you know, all this molecular technology was absent, but then genes were sort of identified as a sort of a discrete entity and no one knew where they resided, but then you could make models. And there was a tremendous amount of interest in sort of trying to figure out, um, well, what is the, um, uh, how is uh, Darwin's theory of evolution uh, realized in, in living organisms? And as it turns out, uh, uh, some of the emphasis on fitness um, is a bit, uh, was a bit misguided. So a lot of mutations, uh, if they don't, you know, kill um, you off uh, immediately, um, they turn out not to make that much of a difference. Um, and that's something that was only realized more recently uh, when it was possible to sort of measure mutation rates. But if we go um, back to Mandel, so he was a uh, um, monk and what was uh, now known as, you, you know, Czechos, um, I guess a Czech Republic. And um, his research could be thought of as uh, partially uh, applied research, you know, that uh, uh, people have been breeding uh, selectively breeding uh, plants and animals for, you know, thousands of years, uh, making, um, trying to create better crops and that kind of thing. So he did these experiments with, uh, with peas. And if you um, look at his original paper, and I'm going to put it on the Moodle in case you're, um, interested in, um, in reading it, um, it, it uh, he puts a lot of emphasis on the experimental um, practicality. So with these peas, you can, um, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, really control um, the, what crossbreeds with what. And, and, and get data that isn't contaminated, which is really a um, problem here. So you have the stigma and it receives the pollen um, um, created from this part of the flower, or it can be from other parts of the flower. And here, you know, it's um, sort of described in the how this is cut off and then the experimentalist uh, will, um, you know, with the um, brush take the pollen from one flower and put it to the other. So you, uh, you, you, you really know what is going on and, and what, what happens. So, um, uh, in this example here, you have um, what is described by uh, a single gene. So he takes these uh, peas that are sort of very uh, 
pure bread that have white flowers and others with red flowers. And he crosses them and with um, a, a probability of one, the color is all red in, in the next generation. And then you breed uh, these with each other and you find out that exactly uh, a quarter of the time uh, a white flower appears. So um, the idea or the sort of mathematical model behind this is that there are these um, two copies of these discrete elements called genes. So um, at the time these would have been seen as very um, abstract quantities. Nobody really knows what they are. And there's a, one is chosen from each pair. And um, so in this case, the result is completely deterministic in terms of the first generation. And then in the next generation, you make the square and with this particular gene, um, uh, the red is uh, allele is dominant, which means that um, one gene uh, suffices to create the red color. So only when you get these, um, it's completely absent, do you see a, a white flower? So he, repeated this kind of experiment with a number of traits uh, with a, a huge number of, um, of uh, uh, flowers with, uh, you know, crossbreeding. And you, I mean, one of the results is uh, uh, that, I mean, that you, you would have to repeat this many times in order to figure out that the probability is at least is exactly one quarter because with the finite number of realizations, um, uh, there would um, be sort of statistical noise. You know, this is sort of like a flipping a coin, which, um, which of the two genes is chosen for the um, progeny in each of the, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of double genes that are, are contributing. So we can um, make a, a theory about this and um, you can um, play around with it. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just show you some formulae. I won't go through all of this text, but um, uh, here we use uh, sort of the capital B for the dominant, the uh, little b for the recessive version. You can do whatever you want. And this sort of um, uh, uh, inheritance applies to, you know, any organism that is diploid. Um, so that would be humans, uh, uh, a lot of plants, um, it wouldn't apply to, to bacteria, it wouldn't apply to, to viruses, but, um, and there are also plants that have, uh, like wheat has six copies of um, each uh, chromosome. So there, you, you could generalize this, this theory, but, um, I'm going to use this uh, cross is, you know, you cross, you breed these two um, genotypes is, you know, what the uh, pair is and the order doesn't matter. And then we multiply this out symbolically. So this is just like the distributive law and then we get the, the probabilities. So um, that half, half of the time you would get this um, 
what is called a homozygous uh, combination, which means that the pairs of genes are identical. Um, there's the heterozygous where they're different um, and that occurs with probability exactly um, a half. And um, let's see. Yeah, so we can um, do the other combinations. I sort of write this out um, mainly to emphasize that this is a very uh, predictive falsifiable theory. And it's a very uh, indirect way of figuring out what's going on without, you know, um, you having any idea on the mi microscopic level of what's going on. So that's going to take a lot of time um, uh, for that to get sorted out just because the technology didn't exist. Um, there can be more than two alleles for a given gene. So you get these combinations and, you know, we can um, generalize. Um, okay, so this is uh, um, work didn't receive that much attention, but it was, uh, you know, till the early um, 20th century, really, but it was the first quantitative theory of uh, inheritance, you know, other than sort of um, vague ideas of how to um, crossbreed and uh, artificially select uh, crops. And the name genes uh, was introduced in um, 1905, um, uh, you know, with, without really knowing what they are. They're sort of abstract entities. One of the um, sort of qualitative conclusion is that inheritance is not, you know, these sort of mushy quantities where there's a whole spectrum and a continuous variable that um, it's sort of an either or, or choose from a, a discrete set of, of, of possibilities and, you know, randomness. And that wouldn't be um, immediately obvious that, um, that it would work that way, but that was um, experimentally um, established. Okay, we can also um, uh, look at uh, um, probabilities uh, of, uh, um, uh, here we're going to look at a single gene and there are two possibilities or two alleles that are A and B. And um, I'm going to, P, P plus Q is equal to one um, because, you know, probability is conserved. And if you cross these um, enough times, um, you're always going to get this um, distribution of heterozygous and homozygous that's determined by one real parameter rather than um, two real parameters. So, this is a situation where there's no, um, there's random mating, there are no fitness um, considerations. So this is sort of a prediction under certain hypotheses. And this is actually something that, you know, people look at in the, the data to determine, well, um, if, if um, if this equilibrium is violated, then there's a reason. So for example, maybe the BB gene is, um, it is uh, you know, not viable that the offspring uh, will die immediately or with a large probability, then you would be taken out of this uh, equilibrium. This is uh, G.H. Hardy who is known as, you know, hard, a hardcore pure mathematician. And he wrote a, a letter on this. 
okay, not all traits are Mandelian. So, you know, he, this maybe rightfully was ignored to some extent because, you know, most, uh, many uh, characteristics, how tall you are, um, uh, you know, to the extent that they're determined um, genetically, there are many genes that uh, come into play and, and, you know, it's not just one gene. So the um, Mendelian inheritance sort of cherry pick certain genes and it's just this one gene that determines a particular trait. Um, the other thing in this theory is that the genes aren't um, coupled to each other, you know. Um, so if you select for, you know, one gene that doesn't affect um, uh, the other genes and that we will, that's called linkage and, and that gives us some other um, interesting information. So um, this is work from 1905 where you look at uh, two uh, traits that obey this uh, sort of um, dominant obsessive, uh, dominant recessive um, property. So um, there are 16 possibilities. And if you would take, uh, you know, Mendel's uh, hypothesis that inheritance is um, uncorrelated, then this type uh, column in the table indicates what you would um, get. But you can see that there are more than twice as many um, uh, P's in this case that have uh, the recessive recessive. So that means that there's a, a correlation. So there, there's uh, more to this story. And if we go uh, fast forward a little more, this is uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Um, I believe this was in the 30s. He did lots of experiments with fruit flies. And he made a map of these correlations. And this roughly corresponds to the positions of these genes on the chromosomes. So the idea is here you have these uh, chromosomes and then, you know, when they split in two, there's this phenomenon called crossing over. And, and so it's sort of like uh, switching to the other side randomly. And you, you, you have this idea of this notion of uh, genetic distance. What is the amount of um, correlation that you expect. So you can almost map out the chromosomes and the positions on the DNA without even knowing that there's DNA or even knowing that the chromosomes are the, you know, carriers of the genetic um, information. Um, so I think this is kind of, interesting in that, um, of course, uh, today we can do all these, you know, really great things with sequencing, and um, we'll talk about this some more, but uh, the, uh, um, a lot of the theory or the mathematical theory was worked out well before the, you know, rise of um, molecular biology, where we could tell what is uh, going on at the molecular level. Um, just one, um, uh, a lot of the early uh, work in statistics was uh, motivated by um, trying to understand um, uh, the, these kinds of experiments. So this is Ronald Fisher and um, 
I spent most of my time in cosmology and people are always talking about Fisher analyses and, um, and which is sort of almost a trivial contribution of his. It's a sort of quadratic approximation to a likelihood uh, surface. But he spent um, the early part of his uh, uh, career at this uh, Rothamsted experimental station um, basically developing frequentist statistics for analyzing these different uh, genetic and crop experiments. And um, uh, this is uh, really, uh, um, uh, you know, book way ahead of its time where he sort of tries to explain um, things about evolution mathematically. And um, then another um, one of the um, big names in sort of mathematical biology from this epoch is JBS uh, Haldane, um, who was from the UK. And then he, after the Suez crisis, he got tired of the UK and um, went to India to work and became an Indian citizen. Okay, so we're going to um, transition into, um, into sort of the molecular um, biology or the molecular basis for um, inheritance. So here are the um, 23 uh, pairs of human chromosomes that are um, uh, uh, that, that have been stained to make them them visible. Um, so the, the, these are this is sort of the visual incarnation of these uh, strands of RNA that have sort of been bundled in a um, in, in, um, complicated way. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about it. The um, yeah, I think I can do this in the remaining time. Um, tell you a little about the uh, molecular basis so of what is is going on. So today we don't need to do experiments by looking at traits like colors of flowers and stuff like that. We can just look at the molecules and, um, and, and sequence them, both the proteins, DNA, and RNA. So this creates um, tons of data. Um, so let's talk about um, macromolecules. So, um, uh, the, uh, I mean, polymers are um, basically uh, long chains, uh, huge molecules made up by joining either the same element, you know, one after the other. So that's kind of boring. You know, you, you, you can't really uh, send very interesting messages with an alphabet of one letter. You need at least, you know, um, uh, to binary, <laughs> um, you know, other than the length. Um, um, but here you see sort of the structure. There's a repeating element. This is epoxy where you have um, uh, uh, some aromatic rings and, you know, oxygen bridges. This is PVC, which is, um, you know, like the polyethylene, except there's some chlorine. So polyethylene is just like a hydrocarbon that goes on forever and in, in ever, well, not not really, but there's there's nothing really limiting the length, and there's just a single chain of carbons with uh, two um, hydrogens on each side. 
Um, so this this repeats itself. So you're you're not going to create a very interesting repertoire of um, molecules in this way. And if you want to, uh, I mean, you could almost think that if you would want to sort of design, you know, life, you 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 can't you 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 need many many. Uh, molecules, but you need a, a sort of way of constructing them and specifying them other than expecting lots of things to come together by chance. So we'll see that there's sort of an um, organized way of creating um, um, biopolymers. So before I go on, um, I'll just say a few things about uh, macro molecules. So um, in physics, um, people, you know, when you learn quantum mechanics, things sort of often end with the hydrogen atom and maybe the hydrogen H2 plus ion. Um, and if there isn't symmetry, physicists just sort of forget about it. But um, with polymers, there's a lot of uh, interesting um, stuff, and this became, uh, you know, new effects and new techniques uh, involving the renormalization group, and um, you know, the shape. That uh, a large chain like that can't be rigid, so they can be described by self-avoiding random walks, and you have. Uh, entropic forces where it's just the number of configurations that matter. So you, you um, have forces where you take the gradient of this and that explains the elasticity of rubber. So I'll just mention um, Pierre de, uh, de Gen, um, who is one of the founders of uh, polymer physics. And so this is sort of hardcore theory known as soft condensed matter theory. And this was a 1991 Nobel Prize in physics. Okay, so we don't want to um, do polymers that are, you know, just the same thing one after the other. So you want to look at uh, you know, molecules that have a reasonable size that can form, uh, perform a host of different functions. So um, you want a sort of library of elements that can be linked together and that, that they're, each of them is different. So the specific order um, uh, does matter or does matter to some extent and um, uh, for proteins, we have the uh, 20 plus amino acids that are linked together by this bond called the peptide bond. And um, the 20 of them are coded in DNA and then there are a couple of special oddball ones that um, you can sort of forget about that uh, where there are some substitutions that happen after the fact. Uh, for DNA, um, as we all know, there's um, there are, uh, four bases which are denoted as A, C, G, and T, and then there's this sort of backbone. So the bases are sort of plugged into this backbone and then there's the double helix structure that we'll talk about. RNA um, differs in detail, but it's sort of, um, uh, the T is replaced with a U. And both of these are sort of directed, which is unlike the, you know, polyethylene where you, you, you can't tell the head from the tail. So that's sort of a point that will become um, important, um, let's see. Okay, so here the um, uh, amino acids and um, they're um, 
So what you see here is that there's this NH2 or the amide group, which, you know, gives it the amino name. And then there's a carboxyl acid. Um, and, 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 and that part is, is common to all of them. But then the sort of side chain is um, different here. And they um, classify, I mean, all of them is different, but they all of the amino acids are slightly different, but some are um, uh, um, uh, look more like, uh, you know, hydrocarbons, they're nonpolar more or less, whereas others are electrically charged and um, uh, then polar and not polar, and there's some special cases. But um, maybe the point to take away here is that um, there are some replacements that um, are likely to do very little to change the structure of a protein. It's not like everything has to be just one way or it doesn't work. And there's evidence for that. Um, okay, so here we, um, this is just two amino acids um, uh, that get linked together. And here you have this OH group and an H and then water is so-called condensed and you, you get rid of the blue and then this gets hooked onto this. And then these R's, which are not the same, um, uh, are the side chain. And that's sort of what gives the, you know, the alphabet of uh, 20 letters to define a, a protein. Um, okay, and these um, proteins have a direction, you know, there is a, an, an end with uh, uh, amide group and the uh, um, uh, carboxyl group, which, um, uh, you know, define a, a direction. So these are, are, are directed um, uh, polymers. So if you write uh, protein backwards, it's not the, the same protein. And it's the same thing with, uh, with DNA. So this is, this is sort of the basic scheme that um, the linking, you know, doesn't concern these R's, but these R's can be different. So just a um, quick aside, I told you that the polymers were um, self-avoiding random walks. Well, since these different uh, proteins are different, then, you know, they, they want to interact with each other and they want to sort of fold up. And this is a, a very um, important property that determines what the protein can do. And it's also a, a big uh, problem uh, to sort of calculate uh, what the, you know, from the alphabet, the word describing the protein, uh, how is it's going to fold and understanding that. Um, so let's see. So I mentioned the um, alphabet and um, this is uh, from, um, there are these uh, FASTA files, which is sort of a standard uh, file format uh, for describing uh, DNA, RNA, and proteins. And here you have um, the codes for the different uh, proteins. So you can um, see that, um, uh, you know, we can go to strings and Python and computer science and forget about, you know, all the molecular bonds and stuff like that and just describe um, proteins in this way. 
So um, I include this transparency because there's just tons of data on the web. So this is from, I think this is the National Center of uh, Biotechnical Information, National Institute of Health in the US. And they, they have um, all sorts of data on the web. So insulin was the first protein that was, because uh, uh, it's rather short and simple, that was sequenced by Fred Sanger in Cambridge in the 1950s. And it has, I think, 60 um, some uh, amino acids. And here you can see it's a, a word and you, know, you could look up all sorts of other proteins. And if we go to the next page, um, this is a sort of schematic of how it gets uh, folded up and you know, there are different um, um, uh, sort of, there's a secondary structure where it either forms sheets or these helices and, and, um, and, and people use this to sort of figure out, um, you know, how stuff works. Um, okay, so let's go on to um, DNA. Um, so I'm sorry that this um, uh, uh, image is so cluttered, but um, I sort of wanted to um, emphasize that the atoms, you know, rather than something more schematic, but basically you have two polymers that form this sort of twisting double helix, and then there are these um, bases. So there's um, A, G, C, T, and they get uh, paired this way. So if they're sort of a matching, then these um, bases can line up. And this is the uh, discovery of um, uh, Crick and Watson in uh, 1953, what was the structure of this? There were um, competing ideas of some sort of triple uh, polymer. And there's this famous phrase uh, at the end of the, their first paper where they write, it has not escaped our notice that the double structure um, uh, suggests uh, means of, of replication. So you, you have these two strands and you know these are covalent bonds which are very hard to break. And then there are um, hydrogen bonds that uh, sort of tie the two um, strands uh, uh, together, but those can be broken. So, you know, you can uh, make it split by changing the temperature, for example, um, uh, pH and, you know, different stuff, the in environment. And here you can see, um, this is sort of the same uh, structure in, um, you know, a general sense is with proteins that you have this uh, sugar base and um, uh, I mean this, well, base is a, a jargon for something different. So the base is the thing that gets hooked on, um, which is the A, C, G, and T, but this is sort of common. And then this three prime, so the primes, it's just jargon, you, you count the carbons from this oxygen, but this gets uh, connected onto you know, this, which is, this is the closest carbon. So this is sort of three prime and five prime are used to 
um, uh, distinguish the head and the tail. And this, uh, you know, phosphate sort of uh, breaks off and um, here's a, well, there's a, a sort of phosphate bridge that, uh, that forms. And, and, and so you get this polymer and you can see that the five prime end then um, in the three prime end, um, the polymers on each side run in, in different uh, directions. So the double helix is what you have on, um, you know, sort of small scales, but then it, uh, it, it gets sort of wound up and wound around st these histones. And um, I, I mean, for our purposes, these are details that um, aren't so important. Um, so we have codes um, and I'll show you at the very end, um, we won't go through it, but the 30,000 bases of uh, the COVID virus. Um, but um, basically the alphabet is, consists of just uh, four um, possibilities or with uh, RNA, you would replace the T with a U. And then th this is when your sequencing has uh, been, uh, has messed up. So N means you have no clue. And then, you know, well, you know, it's this, but not this, but then it could be this. Um, and then um, uh, the, there's the genetic code. So if you look at this slide, you would think, oh, well, everything is uh, completely understood. Yeah, three um, uh, uh, bases, a triplet of bases determines what, what the protein is. And there's some redundancy because there are 64 possibilities, four times four times four, because it's directed. Um, but um, things are a little more complicated than that because there, you don't know where the word starts. So on each strand, there's um, uh, um, uh, there are three reading frames where you know you could start at uh, position one, two, or three, or the protein could be encoded on the other side, and that is sort of a, a bioinformatics problem to sort of figure out from clues what what starts where. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm almost done and I have to leave some time for questions. So let me just um, uh, sort of state the um, uh, relation between uh, proteins and DNA. We're just going to talk about DNA uh, viruses um, are a little different, but we'll talk about that next time. But um, basically, all the genes reside on the DNA in the form of um, base sequences. So there are proteins, and then there are things at the end, starts and stops and promoters. Um, and the simplified idea that's almost always true is that one gene makes one protein. The gene is first transcribed into a piece of messenger RNA. So you, you get a complementary piece of RNA um, uh, for the gene. And um, then um, that in the um, mitochondria, in the right, Basomes is uh, uh, converted into, into um, proteins, and information only goes from the DNA, uh, you know, to make what proteins are made, but not the other way around. And 
So that's the central dogma. It's not always true. We'll talk about retroviruses. And um, all cells have the same genes, but how they're expressed or which um, proteins are made varies greatly with uh, the types of cells and the regulation of um, you know, making proteins is you know, only a, a partially understood um, process. Um, so I will close with, uh, I'll just show you something, but I'm going to show you the um, COVID-19 genome. So we're going to look at uh, um, uh, the version sequenced from Wuhan um, as early as possible. So this is sort of seen as the common ancestor of all of the virus that is spreading within humans. This is a great uh, simplifying assumption because you know if we would look at something like the flu, well, it never really completely goes away so that there isn't some sort of recent ancestor, the beginning of the flu, where you can put that at the root of your family tree. So uh, we're from this tragedy, at least from the scientific point of view, um, we're kind of lucky in that we have a mathematically uh, simpler problem. Um, oops. the human genome has slightly more than three times 10 to the nine base pairs. So I, um, I just wanted to give that as a, a comparison. So what do we do with all this information? So Mendel would have loved, he had to work so hard for his data and there are these machines that you can buy commercially that just sequence, you know, in Sanger's days, it was, uh, you know, tour de force, but uh, now it's uh, becoming uh, more commonplace. Um, there are a few hundred thousand COVID genomes, so that's a huge amount of data. So what do you do with it? Um, how do you interpret it? So that, that's sort of one of the questions. So um, uh, I told you about these uh, FASTA um, file formats. So um, this is the Wuhan genome and I just typed cat and um, this, is, this is the, the the sequence and uh, you know, so you you kind of get dizzy looking at it and it goes on for about seven pages, but you know, you, you have, um, this is, you know, data rich where big data is not um, um, just hyperbole that people put into their research proposal. So there are 300 plus thousand um, uh, such sequence genomes available, you know, with additional information, not as much as you would like about the place, the date, et cetera. And um, obviously you're not going to stare at this and you know get ideas from looking at this so you you have to figure out what are the uh right questions to ask or how, how do you make sense of all of this sort of seemingly random to the eye um, information so i will will stop at this point and open up for questions Thank you very much, Martin. It was really very, <laughs> very interesting. Uh, uh, a crash course in uh, in genomics <laughs> and uh, and genetics. Um, yeah, you you heard Martin asking for questions, and I will remind you of the book competition. 
Ähm, Sorry, Francesco. You might probably read. There are some questions in the chat. Yeah, no, I, I was just crawling <laughs> to find them for, for Martin. Um, uh, okay, now they are a little bit uh, out of context. Um, uh, and some were answered afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I'm willing to answer anything that's Sorry? useful. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can start from the from the end. Uh, I just uh, you might see it in the chat uh, from the variation of basic reproduction number. If R zero is greater than one, the disease is persisting in a population, and if R is smaller than one, the disease is dying out. How does this differ from the approach used in the example of measles? Oh. Um. The, for a, a finite population, I mean, that this is not particular to measles. I just used, what, what, let, let me sort of explain <laughs> uh, the context maybe. So um, maybe the big difference between COVID-19 and um, in, in measles is that COVID-19 is a new disease. And um, let me just, I mean, it fluctuates, but the, there were numbers like two and three for the uh, basic reproduction number. So, um, you know, we have, uh, uh, millions of people infected now. Um, so there isn't going to be any uh, slightly uh, plausible statistical fluctuation where that's going to make the disease, you know, go away tomorrow. But let's just assume that things just stay the same and there's no vaccine and you know, the rules of the game remain the same. Well, then COVID is going to look more like measles in the early 1900s, where everybody, or sit, say 60% of the population or 70% will get COVID sometime in their life. So you'll find you approach this um, herd immunity threshold and the people at any, and, and the disease rather than dying away um, is the uh, R is about one. And there's this very small group of people that is infected. And then you would get these small um, uh, numbers uh, fluctuations that can sort of drive you towards zero if you have a sufficiently isolated population. So how would COVID compare to measles? Well, I don't think if we would have R is equal to three and 20, it wouldn't make that much of a a difference, I don't think, in these fluctuations, you know, when the disease becomes endemic. But, you know, when you have the number of people infected in the millions, there are no fluctuations. Um, and, and this thing about exponential decay and exponential growth, it's just looking at averages and it's assuming that. Um, the average of a product is the product of the averages, and that isn't true. Um, so there, yeah, uh, fluctuations can be important. So that's a good question. Okay, okay. So we have a, a candidate for the win. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have further questions?
Can I ask a question? Um, I, I, I would be very interested um, with the people who um, uh, modified this program um, uh, to talk with you about that, about lowering the herd immunity. So, you know, maybe on Monday, um, at the beginning of the lecture, it would be interesting to, to hear about people's experiences. Very good. Thank you very much, Martin, for the suggestion. <clears throat> so any, any further questions? If not, we have to declare Tebogo the winner. <laughs> and I will have to ask him to please uh, just uh, share his email with me in the chat so that I can do the necessary arrangements. Yeah. So Tebogo, well done. You, you are the winner. Yeah. yeah it's a very uh, spot on question. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I hope that Tebogo sends us the email. Uh, okay, otherwise I would find, ah, here we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm in, I'm in business. Yeah. Okay. Then um, um, if, the, <clears throat> if there are no more questions, Martin, I can only thank you again uh, very much for another fascinating lecture. And uh, we all learned a lot. Thank you very much. And thank you for the participants as well for joining us uh, this afternoon. And we will see you again tomorrow morning at the usual time, nine o'clock. Uh, and I think it's again the turn of, of Morton to speak about uh, machine learning. Yeah. So uh, Martin, thank you very much. Have a good evening in, uh, in Paris and, um, and, a, and a good afternoon and evening to, to everybody else as well. Thank you. Bye, Martin. Bye, Ilya. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.